Hello, everybody. <clears throat> How come nobody said hello back? What's the matter? Are you mad at me today? Hello. Ah. Abdu Sabor, thank you so much. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> Vanessa. Elijah saying hello. Come on, let's see your faces. We're in class here. We need to see each other. There's Sammy. Elijah. Elijah. Vanessa, like your hair. There you go. Thank you. Angelique. Looking engaged. Thank you very much. Alex is on top of her game as usual. Victoria. Farouk. Come on, Farouk. Say hello, Farouk. Michelle Simmons. Stefan McCain. Oh, Stefan. Working the man bun. I like it. I like it. Great thing about COVID. Give you a chance to grow that hair out and do something. Do something with it. Ojo Genesis, that's a good name. Okay, people, first thing I wanna do today is have a quick quiz to see if anybody's studying. So I um, posted a quiz up to Moodle. I don't know if you guys are having any trouble getting into Moodle. Some people are having a hard time. The, uh, the COVID screen, it's been coming up and it's been a real pain. Um, but go ahead and go to Moodle, see if you can get that. One way or the other, I'm gonna post it up here so you can all see it. Give you about 15 minutes. We'll get back here around 1.20 and we'll talk about the answers. And then we will uh, do some new stuff. Got a lot of talk about today. Okay. Okay, here's the quiz. You just make it so that it's easiest to see if you need to do it on screen. Okay. Okay, so one of the things we talked about last Friday was the dominant negative active in receptor um, experiment. So these questions are all about that. Um, and it's in box 4D. If you don't have your, the textbook with you, you know, go from your notes because I did talk about it. Um, so I'm going to give you until 20 after and we'll come back and talk about the answers. By the way, make sure you're doing it because I'm going to I'm going to call on random people and embarrass them if they don't know what they're doing. That's the plan.
Okay, let's talk about this. Let's discuss our problems here. Okay, first question and easiest question goes to Sammy Robinson. What is a dominant negative receptor? Isn't it just a, uh, like a mutated receptor from like you knocking out? Um, uh, well, I mean, I guess the, the next one's like, I don't, yeah. don't want to say too much because it you know, involves yeah. the second one, but it's mutated right. receptor. But what, what, what does it do? Why is it called dominant negative? Um, I actually, I don't, I don't know, like, like why. Okay. Why, why it's called that. That's okay. Let's move on. Zach Zemer. ZZ. Zach. Question one or two. Question one. What does dominant negative mean? Why is it called dominant negative? It negates the effect of the dominant gene. Not the dominant gene, no. It negates the effect of what? Uh, the hormone response. Right. And how is it doing that? What's it doing? Uh, interfering with the function of the wild type version. So yes, receptor. exactly. It's going to dominate over the wild type version, and it's negative in that it's blocking transmission, not allowing it. So dominant negative, it's going to dominantly knock out the receptor that's there. Good. Well done, Zach. Give yourself three bonus points. They won't be in my grade book, but, you know, keep them for yourself. How is the dominant negative receptor constructed? Sam almost answered this one. Angelique Moore. Okay, so how I understood it, it truncates the TGF beta receptor, right? Uh huh. Of the cDNA, and it deletes the serine or thyrine kinase domain of the cytoplasm. Right, exactly. So you're cutting off this, the kinase domain in the cytoplasm. So you still have the hormone binding, but you don't, but the inside part that's actually going to activate the signal transduction is cut off. So any hormone on the outside of the cell is not going to have any activity because it binds to all these receptors that are not active. Well done, Angelique. I thought I had you with that one. Okay, question three. Oh, I talked about this too. In box 4D, why did they use active and type 2 receptor for the experiment? Why were they using that active and type two receptor? Remember, TGF beta likes have type one and type two, and they use the type two. Elijah Crossborn. I'm just going across the top of my row here, so I don't know if you guys see the same order. Elijah. Is it because the type two receptor phosphorylates the type one receptor? That's true, and that's important. But what else about the type two? Why is it? Why is this? Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that one. Okay, let's go to Alex McKeeran. Why did they use the active in type 2 receptor? I, I talked about this. I don't know if it's in the notes, though. Um, it combines with all the different type 1 receptors. Exactly, exactly. So by putting that active and type 2 in, it's going to knock out all your BMP, it's going to knock out all your XNRs, everything. So it was just a, a way to totally shut off any kind of TGF beta-like signaling between the endoderm and the, and the ectoderm. Well done, my friend. Well done. Okay. Oh, how do they express this in the embryos? I actually used to do these experiments. And we're up to Esha, Esha Gupta. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, didn't they inject the mRNA of the tourniquated activin into, when, into the Xenopus embryo at the two cell stage? Right. 
So they took their cDNA and in vitro, they made messenger RNA out of it. And then they injected that in both cells at the two cell stage. That way, every cell in the, in the, in the resulting embryo will express that, that, um, that dominant negative gene. Jeez, this is too easy. I got to make my exam harder than this. Um, what did they see when they did this? Abducibor. 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 Um, so no mesoderm or actual structures were formed, correct? Correct. And especially no dorsal. It, it ventralizes the embryo. And it was dose dependent. Okay. What is the interpretation of the result of this experiment? And we're up to Farouk. Farouk Nestle Nesselbay. Nesselbay. Farouk, how do you how do you pronounce your last name? It's um Nesebe. Nesebe. Okay. Yeah. So what what do you conclude from this experiment from the results from question five? Um, I'm not I'm not sure if this is correct, but did they um conclude that uh the hormone was responsible for the uh for the dorsal structures? Mostly correct, but not the hormone activin. Remember going back to the question that Alex answered, which I forget which one it was. Um, it knocks out all TGF beta like um, signaling. So, bottom line, that TGF beta like signaling is important for mesoderm induction and for uh, dorsal structures and things like that. Okay. I think you guys did pretty well. We're at 127. I've got a lot I wanted to talk about today. Probably won't get to all of it, but I'm going to start talking about FGF signaling because um, in the last, oops, in the last class, we talked about, well, let's just back up and see that. So let me get my act together here. Yes. Okay, so in the last class, we talked about how um, mesoderm induction, the reason why it's mesoderm is because you get an upregulation of this gene brachyuri, which is kind of mid-level mesoderm. It's not like dorsal mesoderm or ventral mesoderm. It's kind of in the middle. This will, will make things into somites. Um, but at first, it's expressed everywhere in the mesoderm. Um, and its, it's um, expression is... is um, uh, enhanced, I guess, or, or made pretty constant by FGF because brachyuri upregulates FGF, and then you get this autocrine stimulation of the cell that made FGF, makes it bring up brachyuri, makes it bring up FGF. So you get this positive feedback mechanism, and that keeps brachyuri um, expressed strongly in mesoderm. So, question is, what does FGF do? I'm glad you asked. Okay, so this is the FGF mechanism. And I've got, I posted an animation of this today, um, which comes from your, from this textbook. So the figures even look the same. Uh, I think, I hope anyway, most of you have seen this mechanism before. I know I used to teach it in Bio 101 when I did 101. I teach it in cell biology. I think it's in a, I hope anyway, it's taught in a lot of classes because it's pretty important. But this is basically how it works. Your hormone is FGF, and remember, hormone diffusible, released from one spot, can go somewhere else. The receptor then is what we call a receptor tyrosine kinase or a receptor kinase. It is kind of like the TGF beta like receptors in that it's got hormone binding on the outside and then a kinase activity on the inside. So when the hormone shows up, the receptors clump together and then they transphosphorylate, they phosphorylate each other. Um, the big difference here between this receptor and a TGF beta like receptor is one big difference anyway, is that you only have one receptor here. And it's kind of this ends up being like a dimer. Both sides of this are the same. Whereas with your TGF beta, you've got type one and type two, which are different from each other, but clumped together. Another thing that's different here is the kinase activity is phosphorylating on tyrosines. 
Um, I don't know if you know the structure of tyrosine, but it's basically like a fennel ring with an OH on the end of it. So that OH gets phosphorylated. And that's different from most other kinases. There are some other tyrosine kinases, but most kinases are going to phosphorylate on serine or threonine, which also have an OH. That's what gets phosphorylated, the OH on the, on the side group. But this is a tyrosine kinase, um, which makes it a little bit special. Um, that those phosphorylation sites then will attract other proteins to come up and that will <clears throat> um, increase signal transduction. One of the proteins that comes up is called GRAB2 and GRAB2 is like an adapter protein. It'll bind to the receptor, but it also binds to this guy, SOS. SOS is son of sevenless. Again, getting back to the Drosophila development, um, certain mutation caused a lack of the seventh eye spot, the omatidium, in the eyes of the Drosophila, and they called that sevenless. And that turned out to be EGF, which is very similar to FGF. But they found another mutation that was similar to it, so they called it son of sevenless. So this is related to the receptor, so it's that's why they call it son of sevenless. They do the same thing. They're similar to each other. I don't know. That's history. It doesn't really matter. Bottom line is, GRAB2 binds the receptor, but it's also bound to SOS. SOS then is a um, guanine nucleotide release factor, uh, GEF, guanine nucleotide uh, exchange factor, um, which means that G, it will activate a G protein. Hopefully you've all heard of G proteins before. They're pretty, pretty famous, pretty popular. They're bigger than Kardashians in some circles, it's the circles I run in anyway. So G proteins are really popular. Um, RAS is a G protein. It can have either, it's called G because of guanine nucleotides. It can have either GTP attached to, to it or GDP. If it's GDP, RAS is off. If it's GTP, it's on. So typically at a, a cell in RAS, RAS has got GDP on it. And so it's off. So SOS comes along, interacts with RAS, causes it to release its GTP, and then RAS kind of diffuses away and it picks up GTP. So now it's got GTP on and it's active. Eventually it will shut off by another protein called GAP, um, <clears throat> guanine nucleotide, gu no, GTPase activating protein, GAP, GTPase activating protein. So that will cause it to break that GTP down into GDP and then it has to get turned on by SOS again. That aspect isn't that important for us right now. What we mainly want to know is FGF activates the receptor. The receptor brings SOS up close to the membrane where it finds RAS. RAS then gets turned on and it starts this cascade of kinase activations. Um, the first kinase in the, in the scheme is RAF. RAS binds to RAF and activates it. RAF then phosphorylates MAP kinase kinase or RAP of MEC. It, usually it's called MEC, but in this, but it can also be called MAP kinase kinase, um, which is what it is called in this uh, chapter. So MAP kinase kinase gets phosphorylated. It's also a kinase and it's active now. It will then phosphorylate MAP kinase. And that's kind of where they get the name from it. MAP kinase kinase. So kinase is MAP kinase. So anyway, MAP kinase then gets phosphorylated and it becomes active. And then it goes into the nucleus and phosphorylates transcription factors and turns them on. So that's the MAP kinase pathway. Basically, receptor, I mean, hormone binds the receptor, activates this kinase cascade through a G protein, and then you're turning different transcription factors on. Okay, any questions about that? Comments? So no. is the, is the, MEK phosphorylating to MAPK or, um, is it, you know, like with your arrows, what's what's stepping between, uh, what's that, what's happening between uh, MEK and MAP? Oh, between these two? So yeah. this is phosphorylating MAP kinase. So you see, this is without phosphate and this has got the phosphates added. So that's what MEK is doing is phosphorylating it. Okay. So I call this a kinase cascade because we've got this kinase, which activates this kinase, which activates this kinase, which then phosphorylates transcription factors. 
So SOS phosphorylate RAS? No, what SOS does um, is cause RAS to let go of GTP and pick up GDP. Let's, um, let's take a break here. It sounds like, sounds like this is, I, I know I'm going pretty fast on this. Let me bring up a, uh, uh, this might do, bring up a, an animation at this point. Shoot, that's not it. Okay, this is the animation from your from your book on this pathway. Let's go ahead and watch this. Hey, damn your eyes. Okay, so Angelique says, do I have it in the Moodle page? I, I have this animation in the Moodle page, yes. It's down the bottom of the chapter four section. Let's try another one. Uh, so the, the binding of those three molecules, uh, SOS, G, uh, GRB, and RAS, that's what causes the first phorylation? Uh, no. Uh, the the grab two SOS is going to activate the the RAS and but that's not a phosphorylation event that's something different but then that RAS activates uh, RAF and that starts our all the kinase stuff. Let me get another animation here. Um, oh my God! I don't know if you can hear my son, but. He's in middle school and he's next door singing. I don't know why he's singing. It's horrible. It's horrible. But it's so cute, I can't stop him. Okay, this one looks pretty good. Let's watch this. Right. I don't like this. What I don't like about this is you got phosphate floating around and then it sticks to it. That's not how things get phosphorylated. <clears throat> the RTK, um, the kinase domain picks up ATP and uses ATP to phosphorylate itself. But Thank you. 
Okay, so mech is map kinase kinase, erk is map kinase. So erk, they're, you know, map kinase is kind of a general term for all the erks. Erks is extracellular regulated kinase. Don't worry about the nomenclature, basically RAF, MEC, MAP kinase. Okay, so I think this is a lot better than the, the other one that we saw that was from the book. So I'll put this up in Moodle as well, so you can see that. Okay, everybody happy with that? Map kinase pathway? Okay, so I'll put that animation up after class is over. I got a thumbs up from Tyler. You're my man, Tyler. Okay, what am I going to share now? What do I want to share with my friends? Okay, there's that. Oh, come on. Okay, so we've talked about the um, Speeman organizer and how it sets up the uh, dorsal ventral axis. Now we'll talk about how it actually does that, what's, what's causing that. So if we back up a tad, let's see, is it here? Nope, nope, that's next. Okay, so if we back up a little bit, think about it. So um, veg one, no, veg T is expressed in the vegetal pole and that, and then you've got cortical rotation. And the combination of veg T and the beta catenin that builds up because of the cortical rotation causes the production of SAMOA. SAMOA then causes an increase in XNRs. So you get a very high concentration of XNRs here and that makes this into the Speeman organizer by upregulating the transcription factor Guscoid. So Guscoid is, the, is what makes these cells Speeman organizer. And remember too that we've got high XNR here, medium XNR here, and down, and we've got BMP4 all the way through the whole thing. Okay. So mesoderm then is induced by your um, XNRs and by BMP4. Now, how do we make this gradient? If you remember in the last class, we talked about how gradients can cause different results, right? A gradient can cause patterning. Oops. Here we've got activin diffusing away from these beads. So you've got high activin, one result, medium activin, another result, low activin, another result. So that's what's going to happen here. Um, the Speeman organizer is going to release three different factors, cordin, noggin, and follistatin. So these three things are um, diffusible, just like growth factors. They're not really growth factors, but very similar. The proteins that are extracellular, and because they are oops, being released from one specific spot from the Speeman organizer, they're going to be high in concentration here and decreasing in concentration as you go farther away from it. So what these are going to do is block BMP4. So cordin, noggin, follistatin, and also um, there's another one. Uh, uh, no, no, that's, that's different. 
No, well, also that you're going to be blocking WINTS as well, WNT um, patterning, which is done by um, Frizz B. I'll talk about that more in a second. But anyway, cordon noggin and follistatin are being released here, and they bind BMP4 extracellularly. So BMP4 can't bind to its receptor. So they knock out BMP4 activity as they go this way. And because, again, they're like centrally released, you're getting a gradient of cordon noggin and follistatin, which means you're also getting a gradient of BMP4 activity. Over here, there's no cordon or noggin, so BMP4 activity is high. Over here, cordon and noggin, follistatin are high. BMP activity is non-existent. Okay, so that's how you're getting your dorsal ventral axis is by that gradient of BMP4 activity. Um, another thing that's going on that increases this gradient is cordon acts like a shuttle. So cordon gets produced over here. As soon as it sees a BMP4, it grabs it and it diffuses down this way with it, okay? When it gets down here, there's an enzyme there called ADMP, um, anti-dorsal mediating protein, I think it's called. It's a peptide, ADMP. It's a peptide over here and is very specific, specific for cordon. So cordon grabs, grabs BMP4, drags it down here, and when it gets there, it gets broken down by ADMP and releases BMP4 there. So that's also keeping BMP4 activity really high at this end and really low at that end, okay? So that's where our, our, um, our axis is coming from. It's from that gradient of BMP4. Um, another thing that's getting gradiented here, if that's a word, I'm not sure that's a word, is, um, oh shoot, I didn't mean to do that. Gradiented, that's a good word actually. Um, you see, that's the nice thing about being a scientist, you can make up your own words. Whenever you come across something that hasn't been seen before, hey, I'm gonna call it the slush factor. I've named a lot of things after myself, but none of them is caught up on like, you know, like the Golgi apparatus has, unfortunately. Okay, so down, down, down. One second, one second, one second. Okay, so goose coid is inducing the production and release of BNP4 and WINT antagonists. Your BNP4 antagonists are cordon, noggin, and follistatin. Also, another one they don't tell you about is XNR3. Um, remember, before we talked about XNR1, 2, 1, 2, and 4 um, being hormones. XNR3 is an antagonist, but don't worry about that. It's not in this book. We won't talk about it. I just talked about it. What do you mean we won't talk about it? All right. Sorry. Never mind. Another thing it releases is Frizz B. So if you go back and look at that Wnt pathway again, the Wnt receptor is frizzled. Um, but Frizz B is kind of like a soluble form of the hormone binding domain of frizzled. So instead of being attached to the membrane and activating signal transduction, it just floats free and goes through the, the extracellular me medium there. So Frizz B then blocks Wnt act activity because it's binding to Wnt, so Wnt can't bind to its receptor. Um, Dickoff, we've already talked about, blocks Wnt signaling. That's mainly in the the um, ventral part of the of the cell, not ventral, um, the vegetal part of the cell here. And another one we're gonna talk about more in the next class is Cerberus. Cerberus is going to block BMP, XNR, and Wnt. It's a major blocker, it blocks everything. And we'll see in the next class how that blocker Along with um, everything, along with gastrulation, is going to set up our dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior axis. All of it gets put together, um, and Cerber Cerberus has got a lot to do with it. Okay, for a buck, who knows what the mythical origin of the word Cer Cerberus was? Is what was Cerberus? Anyone know? Sammy the three-headed dog. The three-headed dog. That does what? He does uh, it on the room. He guards yeah. the gates of hell. That's right. Guards the gates of hell. Okay. So I'm not sure why that name came up here, 
in probably Drosophila genetics again. I'm not sure why, but there's your Cerberus. Nice. I'm glad you people are so well-rounded. Oh, my God. You must go to a liberal arts institution. Okay, so that's about all I have for you guys today. I have to say how lovely it has been talking to you again, and I hope we can do this again sometime. You guys all free like Wednesday around 1? Why don't we do this again Wednesday at 1? Sound good? Everybody in? Who's in? Who's with me, guys? This is hard. It's hard. Zoom is hard. All right. See you later, guys.